take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, I was kind of amazed last Wednesday night, of course, we had a guest speaker and missionary. Where did he go? He went to Philippians chapter 2, amen? And uh, he actually preached where I would have been tonight. But uh, so we just went on. We'll just keep on moving on, all right? Philippians chapter 3, if you would please stand for the reading of God's word if you're able to this evening. Philippians chapter 3. I said 2, but Philippians chapter 3. Begin reading verse 1. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous. But for you, it is, it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might <clears throat> trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. Concerning a zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is the law, is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteous, which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead." Back in verse 7 will be our text that we'll begin with, that we get our thought from. And that is, what, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost, or count lost for Christ. I'd like to preach a message I've titled, Learning How to Count. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for loving us and the blessings of your word. Now, Lord, I pray in this short time that we have, I pray, Lord, you'd speak to our hearts. Lord, that you would give us something that would be meat to help us to grow. Lord, I pray it would be something that would challenge us to live for you in a greater way. I pray it would be something that would open our eyes to the attacks of Satan in, the, in this world. That we might avoid uh, the snares that Satan sets. And Lord, I pray that we might, as Paul said here, that we might rejoice in you. Thank you, Lord, for your love and mercy. I pray that you bless the teaching and preaching of your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You see them. There are a lot of things that that we can allow to steal our joy, that we can allow to come between us and God, that we can allow to take control in our lives and really mess our lives up. It can be people, it can be things, it can be troubles, it can be religion, or, or maybe how we look at, at life or even look at ourselves. And a lot of those things, if we get to contemplate them, and we don't look at them in the right manner and everything, they, they take control of our lives and they've changed the way we look at things. And Paul brings some things out here. It's easy for us to get caught up in things and not just the tangible things, but the intangible things such as, as uh, fame and, and uh, uh, achievements and, and notoriety and, and rep, a reputation and, and, and wanting people to look at us like we are something. If we're not careful, we can allow that to get in our way from serving God. Paul lays out in these verses, and actually, if you, and we didn't read them, but down in 18 and 19 of this chapter, he lays out in these verses here, he says in verse 18, he says, For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God, now look what it says there, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is their shame, who mind earthly things. They're wrapped up in the world. They're wrapped up in what man thinks about them. They're wrapped up in, in and, and, they, and he, he's talking here even about religious people. People that might be in church. People who might be, uh, uh, that we might call good Christians that, that really might fit this, uh, uh, these scriptures here. But he speaks of the real gain in life which we should be seeking after also. He talks about this. 
like a lot of religion uh, and religious people today, Paul was one of those, before he got saved, that had good morality. He was a good man. He was a religious man, a very religious man. He was in, in the temple. He knew the scriptures. He had sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He had been taught, and, and, uh, uh, but he had enough morality to keep him out of trouble, but he didn't have enough righteousness to get him into heaven. He had enough morality, a good enough man to keep him out of trouble in this life, but not enough righteousness to get him into heaven. You stop and think about that. It was not the bad things that was keeping Paul from going to heaven. This is what I'm going to say. It was the good things that was keeping Paul from going to heaven. The good things. Those things that we would say are good and, and of themselves and in many respects they are good. But if they're in the wrong place and if the emphasis is on them instead of Jesus Christ, then they become bad things. When Paul stopped and really took a, a good look at what he had in his life with all of his great education and, and all, of, all that he had and, and that he was proud of, of his heritage and, and how he had been raised and how that he was in the temple and, and how that he sat at the feet of Gamaliel and all these things and how that he was zealous of what he thought was for the Lord and he was zealous and, and even persecuted the Christians. When he got to looking at that, and then he got to looking at Christ. He found out that what he had was worthless compared to what Jesus Christ had to offer. Paul then lays out two types of righteousness in this section that we've read here of Scripture. It was a, a um, works righteousness or it was a faith righteousness. And there's a lot of folks today that have a work righteousness. They live good lives. They do good things, but they don't have Jesus Christ as their Savior. And there's a lot of people, <clears throat> I've often, I've heard this before. I don't know if it was my, my preacher, Brother Parker, down in Piedmont that said this, but he said there's going to be a lot of good people in hell and a lot of bad people in heaven. A lot of good people in hell and a lot of bad people in heaven. Because it's not our goodness. It's not our righteousness. In fact, the Lord says that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. And so Paul is laying this out here and, uh, for the Philippians. And he's trying to get them to see this because evidently there was a little bit of a problem. there, not a big problem, but somewhat. And he wanted them to see it because everywhere that Paul went, there was a crowd that followed him that was trying to mislead. You go back in the scripture. You look in the book of Acts. You look, you look through the, the teaching of, of Paul there in, in the different books that, that he wrote. And you'll find woven in there, you'll find that there was people that followed him from town to town trying to get him persecuted or trying to pull those who had got saved, new converts, in, back into the law or away from the Lord or into religion again and get them away from true Christianity. And so here's a group that was always following them. And so Paul is warning them of this. But when he begins chapter 3 here, and it wasn't a chapter, but at this point in his writing unto the Philippians, in verse 1, he starts out with reminding them of something here. He reminds them of a great need. And it's a great need for you and me. I want you to look at that verse 1 there. It says, finally, my brethren, he says, rejoice in the Lord. If I preach nothing else tonight, you ought to get that. You ought to nail it down. You ought to practice it. You ought to go back to it daily and look at it and say, rejoice in the Lord. Because many times what we don't is we get, oh my, oh me, instead of rejoicing in the Lord, and we get our eyes turned off of God, and we get our eyes turned on ourselves. And I want you to know something tonight. When you turn your eyes on yourself, you're not going to rejoice in the Lord. You're going to say, oh, me, oh me. Because the problems are going to come. Pretty well all week, my phone's been going ding, 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 ding from... 
from either family members or, or church members that are sick and, and got problems. And, and I, didn't, I forgot to mention Herb. They, got Herb. they brought him back in. He's got some heart problems. Be praying for Herb. They found something going on. His heart's not working right. They laid him out of the hospital. He was in the hospital almost with pneumonia, but he didn't have pneumonia. But his heart's something going on with his heart. So pray for him. Pray for Judy. They're, they're going through a difficult time right now, and she's worried to death, and, and it's hard on her. But if you looked at, at the human side of things and you begin to get your eyes off the Lord, it's woe is me. Woe is me. I look around tonight and it's kind of a, a skeleton crew. I'm glad you're part of the skeleton. Amen. Because we got so many, fit, so many that's sick. And you know what? There's something in, there's something. This is just the way a preacher is. I'm thinking, I got Brother Sam Davidson coming Sunday. Man, the flu is taking everybody out of church. <laughs> and, and, and man, I, they're, they're going to be just, but you know what? The Lord knew that three years ago when I booked him. He knew who'd be here. And so, you know, praise the Lord. So, I, and I just want to, I mean, we just need to rejoice in the Lord. Get our eyes off of our flesh. Get our eyes off of ourself. Get our eyes off the problems and rejoice. He said, to write the same things unto you, to me indeed is not grievous. He said, you know, when I'm writing about these things, these problems and stuff, he said, it's not grievous to me. You know why? He said, because I can rejoice in the Lord. He said, but it's safe to you. He said, for you, he said, but for you, it is safe. He said, otherwise it's going to help you. He's reminding the Philippians and us of that need in our lives of, to not be caught up in this old world and to, to help keep us from drifting our, in our spiritual lives and getting hung up on things. Over in chapter 4, in verse 4, he says there, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Here's a man. Paul is sitting in prison. And out of his mouth comes, hey, listen, he said, rejoice in the Lord. And then he goes over again and says, rejoice in the Lord always. Not just when things are going good. Not just when things are up. Not just when things are, are prosperous. Not just when you've got the grace of hell. Not just when, when you think everything is fine. Now. He said, but rejoice always. Why? To help keep you on track. To help keep your focus on something that's real. Can I tell you that religion will not do that for you. Only Jesus Christ can do that. If you're consistently rejoicing in the Lord and His goodness, it helps keep your focus on the Lord and off of self. Besides, He's worthy of our praise. Amen. Then Paul begins to warn them of the religious crowds that's, that's misleading people here. Notice what he says in verse 2 and 3. He said, beware of... Now look what he's calling. He says, beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. He lists three terms here to refer to the religious crowd and those who were pulling people away from the Lord and, and keeping people from serving Christ, but also keeping people from truly getting born again. And it was a religious crowd. First of all, he says, dogs. Now, if you go through Scripture, generally what you find there is that the Jews referred to the Gentiles. You say, preacher, who is a Gentile? A Gentile is anybody that wasn't a Jew. And they referred to the Gentiles as dogs. Now, we live in a day and time when you talk about a dog, everybody's like, oh. You get on Facebook, you see all these dogs there. It doesn't look so cute and cuddly and everything else. And there's dogs, dogs, dogs. But biblically speaking, in the day and time, dogs were scavengers. They were closer to what we would call more like a, a coyote or a wolf, especially a coyote that, that, that uh, uh, scavenges and, and, and kills and, and uh, cattle and whatever and, and eats uh, junk and, and just roams around here and there. Not domesticated dogs like what we're th we think of. That's what the dogs were like. If you go back uh, and look at when Jehu, when he rode in and where Jezebel was, she had tired her hair. I, I bet that was a sight. Put on all of her makeup, had tired her hair, it says. 
And she was standing in the window, and he says, anybody up there that's for, for, for me and for the Lord? And he said, if so, cast Jezebel down. And she, they cast her down. Well, he went in, he, he trod his horse over top of her, blood sprinkled on the wall, and he went inside, sat down and ate. Finally, he said, told some of the guys, he said, go back outside and bury her. After all, she is a king's daughter. When they went back out, the only thing that was left was a skull, the palms of her hands, and the soles of her feet. The dogs had come in and ate her. That's the type of dogs that, that, uh, the, that the Jews referred to when they would call the Gentiles dogs. Now, so you get the picture. Somebody that scavenges and something that, that does great damage and harm. But now here's Paul and he calls the Jews, the religious crowd, he's calling them dogs. Because they're scavenging, they're trying to destroy, they're trying to pull away, they're trying to cause problems, they're following him wherever he goes. And so we, we find that he called them re religious dogs there. These were those who had false teachings that followed Paul and tried to lead Christians away into, into false doctrines. They could, uh, they could sound good and yet mislead the, the new converts back into, into religion. And, and that was about self and not about Christ. Could I give you an example of that? And I know it's not popular to, to call names, but I'm going to give you an example of that. Mormonism is. That's what Mormonism does. Mormons, they look really good, don't they? They look sharp. They're very nice. They're very pleasant. They do, some good, they do good works. But Mormons will try to pull people out of, and they like to find new converts, people who have just got saved, that don't know their Bible, that hasn't sat under preaching and teaching, and they go and try to scavenge them and pull them into religion. And I don't have time to get into all the very strange things that they actually believe. One of the things is, is that they believe that Jesus Christ and Satan are brothers. And like I said, I ain't got time to get into that about the cults and stuff like that. That's what, that's what was taking place. They was pulling them out. And Paul said, beware of dogs. Beware of those who come and try to pull you away from the truth and get you into religion. It looks good. It may sound good. There's a lot of, of churches today that, that the main emphasis of their service is hype in the music and what they call worship. And, and it may be speaking in tongues. It may be the, a lot of different things that they, that they put into it. And the, the world is flocking to that instead of truth. And basically what it is, is they're scavenging. In churches uh, that's teaching doctrine and teaching what's right, many times they lose people. Tells churches because it seems exciting. It tickles the flesh. And they never feel conviction. They leave there, always feel like, whoo, man, and they've been to a concert. I'm not trying to be critical. I'm not, I'm not trying to tear somebody. But Paul says, beware. Beware. Beware of that. He said, because it looks good, but they will pull you away. And before long, what you do is you're looking at self and religion and, and look at, there's those who say, you know, this and that, you've got to have this in your life and so on. And I'll deal with that a little bit more in another one he's talking about there. And yet they're trying to build up self instead of Jesus Christ. So he said, beware of dogs. Beware of dogs. Then he said there, and he said, be, beware of evil workers. These were those who taught that the, the sinner was saved by faith plus good works, especially works of the law. And so what they would do, they would say, okay, yeah, it, yeah, you got to put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, but you gotta, you got to work at keeping it. You've got you to do all the good works to go with it. 
Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8 says this, 8 down through 10 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, otherwise nothing that you can do, it is a gift of God. And then in verse 9, he lays it out just as plain as it can possibly be laid out. Not of works, lest any man should boast. He said there's people, if you can, if, here's the thing. If it requires works, why did Jesus have to die? It's by grace. It's by faith in Jesus Christ. It's a gift of God. And so he said, be careful of the evil workers that uh, will try to pull you away and say, hey, listen, you've got to do these good works. Uh, now, the good works are to follow. In fact, in verse 10 of that same chapter, Ephesians chapter 2, says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Here's what, how it is. Good works are to follow salvation. Let me say it again. Good works are to follow salvation. Salvation is not to follow good works. And don't get any plainer than what he said in Ephesians. But here was a crowd that was trying to do that. We have the same thing today. We got the same uh, group today that, that will tell you. Well, it, it, and they generally will ask you this. And, and again, I'm not trying to be mean, but uh, he said, beware. And so I'm, I'm trying to tell you, beware. <coughs> They'll ask you this question. Have you received the Holy Ghost? And I look them in the eye and I say, the very moment I receive Christ, I receive the Holy Ghost. And they will say, well, then have you been baptized in the Spirit? And what they're saying is, have you spoken in tongues yet? And I said, I got baptized in the water. The Holy Spirit baptized me in the Spirit when He came in. Well, then you spoke? I said, no. I said, that has ceased. I take more Corinthians. That has ceased. And I said, that was for a sign. And I said, and besides, you practice it wrong anyways. It wasn't the way you, you tried to practice it. And so they will try to add something to faith. Folks, listen to me. <clears throat> Beware of anybody that tries to add something to faith for salvation. It's nothing more than faith in Jesus Christ, His death, His burial, and His resurrection. And by faith, repentance of your sin, asking Him to forgive your sin. You accept Him in your heart by faith. A lot of people try to make it too hard. Well, I've got to be good enough. No, my friend, you're not good enough. Nobody's ever been good enough. Well, preacher, I, yeah, it's faith. I'm trustful, but I've got, I've got to be good. And I've got to, you know, and, I, and I've got to keep... Uh, uh. No, my friend. It's by faith. And what Jesus Christ did for you, and that is it. Nothing more and nothing less. And when you try to, well, I've got, you know, well, I must not because I've, I, I, I sinned. Well, I must not be saved. That's the devil talking. Because do you have faith? Do you believe what Jesus Christ did at, at Calvary? Yeah. Did, did you ask him to come in your heart life and save it? Yeah. Did you mean that? Yeah. Get up and walk away. Devil is whispering in your ear. And realize that it's not by your works that you could keep it. Hey, listen, if it was by works that we could keep it, we'd all lose it. We are sealed, the Bible says, unto the day of redemption. Now, that doesn't mean that, that we can't sin. We do sin. Then there was a concision. Concision. A lot of people look at that and say, well, you know, that's just a lot of people getting mad or something. No, concision there means to cut or to mutilate. That word that's, that's translated into concision. If you look at it in context there, Paul was, was referencing those who talk, taught that you had to be circumcised in order to be saved. That was part of the Jewish law. 
Again, they're trying to add the law back. And Christians don't need anything besides faith in Jesus Christ to be saved. Not circumcision, not baptism, not church membership, not the catechism, not the Lord's Supper. Nothing else can save you except receiving Jesus Christ with your heart. And so he was talking about how that they tried to add all that back in there. And, and they was trying to put the law back in. Trying to make those Gentiles become Jews by the law instead of by a birth of Christ. My friend, I want you to know something. If you're saved, you're a child of God, not by, not by uh, 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 circumcision or not by baptism and not by good works and not by church membership, but you're, you're, you've been adopted by our Heavenly Father into the family and you are a child of God. In contrast, then Paul describes the true Christian salvation in verse 3. He says, for we are the circumcision, and notice what he says, which worship God in the Spirit. My friend, I want you to understand something. In the Spirit means that it's not all your works. He goes on and says, rejoice in Christ Jesus. He said, rejoice in Him. Don't rejoice in your flesh. That boy, you was able to do this, or you was able to do that, or, or you spoke in tongues, or, or you uh, 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 prayed a prayer that was answered, or something like that. He said, listen, rejoice in, Je in Christ Jesus. And he goes on and says, and have no confidence in the flesh. He said, quit building up your flesh that you can be something, that you can do something of yourself. It's not you. Can I tell you something? Tonight? You cannot live the Christian life. I cannot live the Christian life. It must be through Jesus Christ that lives the Christian life through us. As we yield our lives to Him, then He lives the Christian life through us, empowering us to do what He wants us to do. Then Paul gives his testimony of trust in the flesh before true salvation. He said, I want you to understand how this works. He said, I want you to see this. And so he uses himself. Begin in verse 4 there. He says, though I might have also confidence in the flesh. He said, he said I can look at my flesh. He said, I can look at all the good things I've done. He said, if any other man thinketh that he, he hath, whereof he might trust in the flesh. He said, I'm more. He said, you know what? He said, I, I think I stood uh, show, uh, head and shoulders above everybody else when it comes to being religious and doing good things and doing what the, what the law said. Now, look what he says. He says, circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel. He gives these credentials here. Of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. He said, I have kept the law. But it really he hadn't, because he was proud about his flesh. Before he truly salvation, Paul was sincere about what he did. But he was sincerely wrong. You're going to run across a lot of people who are sincere about what they do. I mentioned a couple of groups a while ago. They're sincere. But they're sincerely wrong, according to Scripture. Not according to me, but according to Scripture. And they need to see that. They need to see those things. Paul was measuring himself by the wrong measuring stick. That would be like, Aaron, how tall are you? 5'2"? That would be like Aaron going out here and saying, you know what? I've always wanted to be six foot. So she goes out and she gets her a, 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 a big long pole and she begins to mark it off different. Holds it up and says she's six foot. That was her measuring stick. That was not the standard. Here's what's happening today. We measure ourselves like Paul did. We measure ourselves by ourselves. Well, I'm a pretty good person. I'm not that bad. Man, after all, look at so-and-so. Look at, look at those people that, that's in prison. Look at those people who are, are on drugs. Look at those people who, uh, look, 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 you know, and we, and we find a different measuring stick to make us look better than what we are. Measuring ourselves by ourselves. 
or measuring ourselves by someone else and saying that we're better than they are. And so Paul uh, said, listen, you're using, or he said, I was using the wrong measuring stick. The measuring stick should be Christ and the Word of God. Then lastly, Paul learns to count. Here's where I got my, what he's talking about. Paul learns to count by God's standard and, and lose those things that, that, that might, he might count as gain. But he loses them so that he can gain. Look at verse 7. We'll read there. It says, But what things I were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless I count all those things, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. And be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of man by faith, that I may know him <clears throat> and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. And so Paul said, listen, here's how I count things. He said, I count he said, I, all those things that were gained to me, when, when, and, and what it was is those things that we just read. Uh, circumcised the eighth day uh, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, the Hebrew of Hebrews, touching the law, a Pharisee cons concerning zeal, persecuting church, touching, uh, uh, touching righteousness, uh, which is in the law, blameless. He said, all those things, he said, I shove them aside. He said, I count them as lost. He said, they're no good. He said, because that's what I did. That's what my flesh did. That was all about me. And that builds me up and makes me feel like I'm something. He said, I count it as loss. The reason he said I count it as loss, he said, that I might gain. He said, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Those things become gain in his life there. Paul learned to count all the things that that made his flesh look good to man as a loss. Do you know what? We're not here to impress one another. We're here to please God. We're here to live for the Lord. If I set out to impress you, that's my flesh. If you set out to show somebody how spiritual you are and, and do these things to show people how spiritual you are, that's the flesh. That's the flesh. I'm not saying those things aren't good. I'm just saying that when you set out to do that, that others might look upon you. It's the flesh. He counted those things that exalted him as dung, the Bible says there. That he might take up that which exalts Christ. Look at what he gains and what we can also gain also here. Look in verse 8. He says, Yea, doubtless I count all things but lost. For the, and here's what he says, this is what I got. He said, I gained this. When I gave up the other stuff, this is what I got. He said, excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. He said, that's what I got. When I gave up the other stuff, he said, I got to know Jesus Christ. I got saved. I have eternal home in heaven. When I gave up all the religion, when I gave up all the junk that everybody else thought was so important, that I thought was so important, he said, he said, I got the knowledge of Christ, Jesus Christ, my Lord. He said, he become my savior here. The ability to have a personal relationship with him. To know him personally, not just know about. Paul knew about things, but he didn't know the Lord personally. Now he says, I know him personally. Verse 9, he says, and be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith of Christ. He said, the righteousness which is of God by faith. He said, I got the righteousness of God by faith. He said, I used to go about wanting the right, my righteousness. He said, it was all about my righteousness, all the good things that I could do, all the abilities that I had, and, and living such a stringent life, and, and dotting every I, and crossing every T. And, and, and he said, you know, I was zealous uh, for the church, and, and, and my religion was a strong religion. He said, I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And he said, all these things, he said, that was my righteousness. He said, I gave that up so that I could have the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
I've illustrated for him. I'm not going to do it tonight, but the Bible says that, that, that the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed unto us. That means it's placed upon us. When the Lord looks at a born-again Christian, He doesn't look at you and your righteousness. He looks at the blood and the righteousness of His Son that's placed upon you. And it covers your unrighteousness. And that's what He looks at. That's what He sees. He said, Preacher, how can He do that? God can do anything He wants to. And that's what He has chosen to do is to look at his son's righteousness instead of our righteousness. Again, the Bible says that our righteousnesses are as, a, as filthy rags. But the righteousness of Jesus Christ is perfect. And so Paul said, you know what? All that stuff I had, he said, that was my righteousness. He said, I gave that all up for the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Do you realize what you got tonight if you're saved? Do you realize that, hey, listen... You're cloaked. Yeah, you sin. But you can get forgiveness of that sin. And you're cloaked in the, in the righteousness of Jesus Christ when God looks at you. And oh, how he loves you and cares for you. Paul said, that's what I got. It's that righteousness. Imputed righteousness, not our righteousness. Then verse 10 says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. And then he says, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. That fellowship. He said, you know what else I got? He said, I got the relationship with him. But he said, I've got fellowship with him. I can visit with him. He can, and he said, I enjoy my, my life with him. I enjoy the things of God. He enjoys that fellowship. We became a Christian, an ability to walk with the Lord daily. Paul gained far more than, than he lost. He gave up all the, his flesh. And he gained so much more. And that's why he could say, rejoice in the Lord. That's why he could say, rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice. Because it wasn't about him. His life was then about Jesus Christ. Do you know what we do a lot of times as Christians? We're running around trying to rubber stamp everything. I've got to be like this. 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 And what you're looking at is your righteousness. If you'll ever get a hold of the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ has imputed His righteousness in your life, you won't worry about the rubber stamp. You just want to live for Christ. You want to please Him, not yourself, not everybody else. And you'll seek what he wants in your life. And you'll desire that walk with him. And you'll desire that fellowship with him. Instead of religion. Instead of religion. Paul said, I gave it all up. You say, well, preacher, isn't there <clears throat> things that we should? Oh, yeah, there's things that we should do. Things that we should. The scripture lays that out. But I'm going to tell you something. Instead of doing it for you or for man, you're doing it because you want to please God. I get up here, man, I can lay down something. Man, everybody in this room, man, y'all, bless God. You fellas, the Bible says to pray with your head uncovered. Look at that. Y'all go get that hair cut. Brother, Brother Jerry and I are the only spiritual ones in here. We got our heads uncovered. Well, that's a bunch of garbage, number one, so taking Scripture out of context, but you don't do it for the preacher. I'll give you an example and I'll close. I wanted to please God. I wanted to do what was right. Jeannie and I, in early year of our ministry, of course, we was, I was youth pastor. I sat on the front row. And uh, our kids had to sit with us there and, or, or right behind us but we had teenagers we had teenagers all set we sat there and they sat right there with us all the teenagers 
unless they sit with their parents. They sit with us. And uh, I remember preaching. I'm going to call him by name. He was preaching. And he said, some of you are wearing your pride on your upper lip. Yeah, I'm talking about a mustache. Of course, he had sideburns down to here. <clears throat> and so I, it bothered me. Because here's a preacher. He's a pretty hard preacher. Good preacher. Uh, pretty good preacher and everything. Evangelist and stuff. And he's preaching against mustaches. Well, I've had this mustache since I was a senior in high school. It has never been cut off. Right now, I don't ever want to cut off because my lip will look like it's that long. So it bothered me. So I, I went to a good godly preacher besides Brother Parker. And I asked the man. Brother Clifford Rice. I said, Brother Rice, I said, I'm willing to shave my mustache off. I said, I, I like it. My wife loves it. He, he said, does your wife like it? And I said, yeah, she does. Covers up part of my face. <laughs> he said, what's the problem? He said, you're not there for man. He said, you're there for God. I later found out the scripture that that guy used for that. If you, took it, if you took it in context, it was a Levitical cleansing and you would have to shave every hair on your body. I mean, he had sideburns down to here. He needs to start with himself. And you see how we get, if we're not careful, we get in man's mold. Because we're trying to please man. Now, there's some things laid out in Scripture, don't get me wrong, that we should be doing. But we don't do it for man. We do it for God. Because if otherwise, it becomes our righteousness. Let's pray. Father, thank you for loving us. Lord, I pray that you be with us now. Help us to glorify you. Lord, I pray that we would allow you to direct us and guide us. Lord, I pray that we would rejoice in you and that we would magnify you. Lord, that we'd walk in you, that we would... Put aside the flesh, and Lord, that we would rejoice and walk in that fellowship with you, in that relationship. And Lord, I pray that you be pleased with our lives. Let's pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. <coughs> We're going to sing.